Hey, this is Pump Lunch, and this video runs through deploying and interacting with UMA's Sandbox Oracle environment. And we're going to use UMA's Dev Quick Start OOV3 repo and Foundry. And this will allow you to deploy your own version of the Optimistic Oracle to any EVM network. And the deployed contracts are all the same as UMA's live contracts, except for a mock dispute resolution contract that replaces the dispute voting system which is impractical for testing. And this can be useful for testing your project's handling of resolved disputes, for using the Oracle on EVM networks that UMA does not currently support, and gaining owner privileges on UMA contracts so you can whitelist tokens, custom price identifiers, or change a final fee. Uh, as I said, Four, we'll use Foundry, which is a smart contract development tool chain. But don't worry if you haven't used it before. I'll run through installing it, uh, any commands we use, and there's a link below to the Foundry docs. Uh, one important note about Foundry is it does not support Windows terminals. So you must be using Mac, Linux, or WSL if you're using Windows. WSL is Windows subsystem for Linux and allows you to run a Linux environment on your Windows machine. So if you need to do that, check out the resources below. The links also include a gist file that has all the .env variables we'll need and all the command line commands we're going to be running. And there's also a link to the GitHub repo that we're going to be cloning and a link to the UMA Discord where you can get dev support on this video or for any problem you're having integrating with UMA. So switching over to my terminal now, I'm using Ubuntu through WSL on a Windows machine, but any Mac or Linux-like environment should work just fine. And to start installing Foundry, we're just going to follow the commands that they list in their docs. And so the first command is curl uh, this Foundry paradigm XYZ link, uh, pipe bash. And so curl is going to download the file at this link. Capital L means it's going to follow any redirects that this link sends it to. And then the pipe is going to take the command on the left and take the return value of that and use it as the input for the command to the right. So basically bash is going to run the file downloaded here. We now have Foundry up installed on our command line, so we can run that and that will install Foundry, or if you already have Foundry, it'll update to the latest versions. And so you can see this installed Forge, Cast, Anvil, and Chisel, which are all tools uh, that are part of Foundry. So now I'll run clear to clear my terminal, and then I'm going to clone the dev quick start repo. I'm going to run get clone and paste in the link, which is below. And again, all the commands are in the gist file link below as well. So now we've cloned the dev quick start OOV3 repo off of uh, UMA's GitHub to our local file. So now I will change into that directory. So CD to change directory. And then if you just start typing in the folder name and then press tab, it will finish the name for you. So now I've changed that to directory. And the first thing I'm going to run do is run forge install. And so forge is a command line. Uh, tool for Foundry and install is going to install all the dependencies uh, listed in the repo. And now that's done. I'm going to run code space period and that's going to open my code editor in that repo. The repo is set up like any typical Foundry project. So we have the lib folder which contains any uh, dev dependencies. So these are all packages that have smart contracts that are referenced uh, within the repo. We have a script folder, which contains scripts. And so the Oracle Sandbox script is what we're going to use to deploy all the contracts for the sandboxed Oracle environment. And so you can see uh, it's importing contracts from our lib folder. So no smart contracts written in this repo are actually used in this script, but they're all um, imported from the dependencies. 
Uh, the source folder in Foundry Projects contains the smart contracts that are developed in this repo. So there's three uh, smart contracts here, and these are all uh, example projects to help you get started building on top of UMA. So we're not going to use these in today's video, but they are helpful uh, if you're building smart contracts that interact with UMA. And there's also test files for those smart contracts as well under test, but again, we won't be using those today. Then also there's the Foundry TOML file, and this is where you put your settings for Foundry, but the repos are set up to use default settings. So the first thing I'll do in our repo is I'm gonna create a new .env file in our root folder. This is gonna store environmental variables that'll be used throughout our repo. And one very important thing anytime you use a .env file is you make sure that uh, .env is added in your git ignore file. So anything in the git ignore file is not going to be include, included in commits to uh, GitHub. So you just want to make sure that you do this so that um, any sensitive information included in the .env file will never be pushed to GitHub. And so after you save that and close that, you'll see that uh, on the left side of my code editor, that any file or folder that's grayed out is not gonna be included in any git commit. So let's switch back to our .env file and I'm gonna to go to the gist file um, linked to below and you can see all the variables there that will be needed for our .env file. So I'll paste them in here and I'll just quickly explain them. So the ETH RPC URL is the RPC that will be used to access the blockchain. So you can get that from Alchemy or Infura and they have free accounts. And the network you want to use, you'll have to set that before you copy and paste the URL here. And then we'll have our private key, which is going to be a jumble of hexadecimal characters. Um, and so there's two very important security uh, steps I take when I use private keys. First of all, like we just talked about, making sure that .env is included in the git ignore, so that when I paste my private key here, it won't ever be shared onto GitHub. And secondly, I'm gonna use a private key for an address that doesn't hold anything of real value. So its address should not have any tokens or NFTs on ETH mainnet, any L2, or any other chain that is uh, compatible with Ethereum addresses like Avalanche. And continuing on, I also have the user address here, which this is basically the public address for this private key, so they have to correspond. And we have this just to make our commands easier as we go forward. We have an Etherscan API key here, and so you can get that from Etherscan for free. And this API key is going to be used so that we can automatically verify our contracts on Etherscan when we deploy them. Uh, you can also put API keys in here for uh, other block explorers, but you'll have to read the Foundry docs uh, for how to do that. And continuing on to the second block of variables here, these are all variables that are gonna be used by our script that's gonna deploy the Sandbox Oracle environment. And they are all actually optional because if you look in the script file, there's this cool Foundry command vm.env or, and so basically you can put in uh, .env uh, variable name here and it will use that but if it does not find that it will use this default value that's the second argument in the function so all of these variables are optional most of them I haven't used an important thing to remember when going through these variables is that the Oracle contracts we're going to deploy are going to be brand new so they're not going to have any whitelisted identifiers or currencies so even though the current mainnet Optimistic Oracle has, say, USDC and DAI whitelisted. Uh, they're not going to be whitelisted on these contracts we deploy. So you have to add any identifiers or currencies you want to use. And so the price default identifier here is going to be for our price identifier. And I'm not going to put anything in. I'm just going to use the value that was in the script, which is going to be assert truth. The default, default liveness is the liveness period in seconds um, that any assertion will be available to be disputed. 
And so I'm going to use 600 seconds, which is 10 minutes, which will give us just enough time for testing to dispute assertions. Uh, the default currency, I'm going to leave blank, which the script is actually going to deploy a new mintable ERC20 contract unless you uh, put in the address for a default currency. And when it deploys a new ERC20, it's going to use these values, which again, I'm not putting in a custom value here. I'm just going to use the value from the script. And you can also set the minimum bond for the Oracle. So any assertion or disputes are going to have to uh, give a bond that's going to match this. And I'm using a minimum bond of zero so that I don't have to worry about minting and transferring and approving ERC20s for this. But obviously, uh, this default liveness and minimum bond are testing values. So you may want to set them differently. And lastly, I have these addresses here for contracts, and I will paste those in later after we deploy them. So with our .env file all set up, we're ready now to flip back to our terminal and deploy the contracts. So the first thing I'll do is I'm going to run source.env. And so that's basically going to load all the env variables into our terminal so they are available. And so you can just test that out by running echo. Uh, we'll put in minimum bond. And so you can see our minimum bond is set to zero, and that's readable from our .env file. So one important thing to remember is that anytime you edit the .env file, we'll have to run source.env again to update those variables in the terminal. And so I'm going to paste the script command from the gist file link below. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to use the Forge command line tool, which is Foundry's tool for uh, building, testing, and deploying contracts. And we're going to use the script command, which is going to run the script that we have linked to at the bottom here. And the broadcast option means that uh, the script is going to be run on chain rather than on your local environment. And here we have our ETH RPC URL. And then we're going to paste in our private key here as well. And so that's for the account that's going to run, be used by the script. And then we're also using the verify option to verify any contracts that are deployed using the script. And so now that the command's finished running, I'll run through the console logs. So first, uh, Forge compiled all the contracts. And then it ran the script successfully and console logged out all the addresses of the contracts deployed. And then there's some additional info about the gas used and the transaction receipts are all listed here. And one thing you'll probably want to do is copy and paste all these addresses to a text file for future reference. Um, and as listed down at the bottom, uh, the transactions are saved to the broadcast folder in our repo. So that's another way to find the addresses uh, of our deployed contracts. So the broadcast uh, folder here, you can see it's grayed out. So it's not going to be included in any git commit. Uh, if you open it up and look at the run, you can find all the uh, contracts that were created. So we have our finder contract here at this address store contract was deployed to this address and so on and so forth. So now that we've deployed these contracts to the blockchain, they can be interacted with in any number of different ways. Um, maybe if you're doing a hackathon and more used to hard hat, um, you could just interact with the co deployed contracts through your hard hat repo. Uh, if you're doing like detailed testing, um, you could write scripts and testing files that uh, interact with these contracts. Um, and a third option that I'm gonna continue on in this video is we're gonna interact with these deployed contracts through Foundry command line tools. And so we're gonna assert, dispute, and resolve uh, truths made to the Oracle. And so you can follow along if you're interested in that, um, or even if you're gonna do it a different way, you can follow along to see the assert, dispute, and resolve uh, transaction flow uh, for working with the optimistic oracle. So 
to interact with the Oracle through the Foundry command line tools, first thing I'm gonna do is update my .env file to include the addresses for the OOV3 and the mock Oracle address. As I explained, I'm gonna get that from the broadcast folder. So our optimistic Oracle B3 is at this address. And I'll search for mock. So the mock Oracle ancillary is this address. I'm gonna copy and paste that into mock Oracle address. And then uh, I'll save the .env file and head over to my terminal and run source.env. So I'll update all the .env variables in my terminal. Now I'm gonna paste the command from the gist file link below for asserting uh, truth to the Oracle. And so it's a really long command, looks really complicated, but as I walk through it step by step, hopefully it'll be simple to understand. So we're using export uh, assertion ID. So what that's gonna do is create a new variable in our terminal called assertion ID. And that assertion ID uh, is stored on the optimistic Oracle and we'll use that in the future to dispute this assertion. So assertion ID is gonna be set equal to everything in this dollar sign and brackets. And we are using the foundry command line tool cast, which is used to interact with the blockchain and the send command to send a transaction. And so we're gonna assign that transaction with the private key from our .env file. And uh, the send transaction is gonna return the transaction receipt. And this uh, JSON option is gonna have it returned in JSON format. And our transaction is gonna be sent to our OOV3 address. And this is the function selector that it's going to hit. So we're gonna call the assert truth with the false function. And it has two arguments. First one is bytes, and this is the claim that is being asserted. And so the next argument, uh, or the next line is the argument for the claim. And so we're gonna use test claim, but that's just a string, but we want it in bytes. So we're gonna use cast from UTF-8 to convert that string to bytes. And then the second, uh, argument is an address of the asserter, and we're just gonna set our own user address as the asserter address. And so that cast send command is gonna return a transaction receipt, and that receipt is gonna be passed through the pipe command and as an input to the jq command. And jq is a command line tool which parses JSON. So we're gonna use jq to parse the transaction receipt, to output just the assertion ID. And before we get into the command, I'm just gonna open the transaction receipt in my code editor so we can walk through what we're trying to conceptually do. So transaction receipt has a number of different fields. One of them is the logs, which contains an array of individual logs. And each log is corresponds to uh, an event that was emitted by the transaction. And so I know that the optimistic oracle is going to emit an assertion made event. And that assertion made event is gonna include the assertion ID I want to return. So I can search through the logs for a log that contains our, our OOV3 address, right? So I'm gonna grab that from a env file, paste it into search. So here we found the individual log, which came from our OOV3 address. And then the topics array includes four different topics. Um, and if you look at the event in Solidity, you can see that there's three indexed topics. And so those are the topics that are emitted into the log. Um, the first topic in the log is gonna be the assertion made uh, event selector. So it's basically a hash of the uh, event name and all the arguments within it. And then the, so then the assertion ID would be next in index one. So this will be our index ID. 
And the way we get to that from the command line is we use JQ to parse the JSON. This R option means it's going to return raw text. This arg option means we're going to set uh, this OOV3 lowercase. That's going to be a new variable that's used only within this JQ command. And we're going to set that OOV3 lowercase equal to the OOV3 address uh, converted with all the text characters to lowercase. And so we're echoing the v3 address into the t tr utility, which is used to convert text. And we're converting all uppercase characters to lowercase characters. And then as JQ parses the JSON receipt, it's going to look within the logs and it's going to return those logs through the pipe to this side. And we're going to select the log where the address is equal to the lowercase version of our OOV3 address. And from that log, we're going to return uh, the first index from the topics array, which, as we saw before, is going to be our assertion ID. That was a lot of complicated commands. I'm just going to double check using echo assertion ID. And we have 626B. And if I look back into the receipt that I copied, uh, it matches 626B. And if you want to check it on Etherscan, you can also go to the transaction based on the transaction hash, go over to the logs. And then you can scroll down to our OOV3 address, this one here, and you can see the, the assertion made event and index topic one is assertion ID. And under topics one, you can see the ID, which again is 626B. So now that our assertion is on the OOV3, it is available to be disputed for the duration of the liveness period. If it's not disputed, it'll be optimistically assumed to be correct. Um, but we're going to test the dispute flow just so we can um, go through all transactions related to the Oracle. So I'm going to use paste in this command, which is in the gist file link below. And it's going to be very similar to our assertion transaction. Um, we're going to create a new variable called request ID. That request ID will be needed later to resolve the dispute. And inside, we're going to use the cast send command again. Again, it's going to be signed by our private key, and we're going to return JSON, and it's going to be transaction to be sent to the OOV3 address. We're going to hit the dispute assertion transaction, and we use our assertion ID, which we got from our last transaction. Um, and the OOV3 is going to use that to find the assertion that you want to dispute. And this disputer address is going to be our user address. And again, the cast send command is going to return a receipt, which we are going to uh, parse with JQ. And we're going to do the same trick here to get the mock uh, Oracle address uh, in lowercase. So that's this line. And then we are going to parse the receipt to go into the logs and select uh, the log with where the address equals our mock oracle address in lowercase. And this time we're going to grab the third topic, which is going to correspond to the request ID that's going to be used for resolving the dispute. And that transaction's gone through. So I'll just prove that out again on Etherscan. So this is the address I'm using my EOA. And you can see the last transaction was the dispute assertion transaction. And if I go here and look into the logs, and I look for the log with our OOV3 address, there is a price request added event. And so that's a price request sent from the Oracle to the contracts that is going to resolve the dispute. And you can see um, the index topic three is going to be the request ID 
And so it's F495. So on the official UMA contracts on mainnets, when a dispute is created, it's going to be sent to what UMA calls the DVM, the data verification mechanism. And basically that's going to get all uh, staked UMA holders to vote to resolve the dispute. And that's done over a 48 hour period and requires minimum quorums and, and stuff like that, which is not practical for our uh, sandbox Oracle environment. So the sandbox Oracle environment rather deploys a mock Oracle ancillary contract. And basically that's gonna allow us as the owner of the contract to push a decision on the dispute. So I'm gonna paste the command from the gist file link below. And I'll quickly run through it again. It's just cast send. And we're using our private key to send to sign the transaction. We're sending it to the mock Oracle address, which we've uh, put into our .env file and loaded to our terminal. We're calling the push price by request ID function. And the first bytes argument is the request ID, which we saved as a variable in our terminal uh, previously. And then second argument is a uh, int 256 which is going to be the resolution and so uh, by convention one uh, e to the 18 is going to be that the assertion was true and so that's what we're sending here and we're just uh, converting from one to way is this going to scale up to one by 10 to the 18 to give a true result if you want to push a false result, uh, you would just use zero as this second argument. And so that command has finished and uh, cast send is going to return the transaction receipt. And since we aren't uh, parsing this all with JQ and setting variables and stuff, it's actually going to console log in this case. And so you can see the full transaction receipt. And if you want to see it on a block scanner you can copy the transaction hash and paste that in so we've created an assertion disputed it and resolved it now and so you probably think we're finally done but there's one more transaction that's needed and that's to settle the assertion on the optimistic oracle and the reason that's needed is assertions are ready to be settled either after the liveness period has expired for undisputed assertions or for disputed assertions, the assertion is only ready to be settled after the uh, voting period has elapsed. And the smart contracts can't be set to update state uh, at a certain timestamp because Ethereum state can only be updated uh, by transactions that are signed and sent by an EOA. So we need to send this last transaction to settle our assertion. So we're going to use cast send again, signed with our private key. We're going to send this transaction to the OOV3, and we're going to call settle assertion, and the only argument required is the assertion ID. And again, you can see it's going to return the transaction receipt. And now just to verify that the assertion has been resolved, we can read the assertion result. So I'll paste the command from the gist file. We're going to use cast again, but this time rather than send for sending a transaction, we're going to use call, which is for calling view only functions on the blockchain. So this is when you're getting information or calling a function that gets information from the blockchain, but does not change any state. So it doesn't require a transaction. And so we're going to call the OOV3. We're going to call get assertion result. And the only argument needed is the assertion ID, which we have pasted in here below. And it's going to return a bool as to whether that assertion uh, was true or false. And it's going to return true. Thanks for watching the video, and if you made it this far, uh, we'd welcome you to follow the link below to the UMA Discord, uh, where we'd be excited to hear about what you're building and happy to lend any support.